Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this panel on single EU financial market supervision. Today, we will uh, discuss the different possible approach to and benefit of single supervision, supervision of EU capital market, which typically refer to centralized supervision by an EU level authority across all the EU member states. To recap, the debate about single supervision stems from the observation that market participants operating across EU borders currently face not only different rule books and uh, multiple supervision, but also potential inconsistency implementation of otherwise similar rules. This complex supervision landscape contributes to the persistent market fragmentation we see today. As we know, ESMA is doing ex extensive work to promote the, convergency, the convergence of supervisory practices through guidelines, peer review, Q&As, and other tools. And we have to, and we have Verena and her colleague to thank for considerable progress in this respect. Still, we acknowledge that ESMA powers and resources are limited. Single supervision could promote the consistent implementation of rules, reduce the regulatory complexity, and contribute to a level playing field in the EU capital markets. A single supervision supervisor could also be better positioned to monitor, assess, and act on possible cross-border risks. Convergence, integration, or even centralization in supervision are the four key topics in the current CMU debate Along, alongside the regulatory harmonization and the consolidation of the trading and post-trading landscape, a topic that was extensively discussed this morning. The momentum to address the currently fragmented supervisory landscape seems to be building. Recently, Eurogroup, ESMA, and the ECB Governing Council have called for action on this key issue in the next legislative cycle, albeit with varying degree of ambition that reflect the political hurdles that remain to be overcome. In principle, different approaches to single supervision are possible, and I look forward to hearing the views of our panelists today on this topic. In this CMU debate so far, I have heard views in favor of a centralized authority, possibly ESMA, a view that we largely share here at the ECB, which could uh, supervise key capital market actors similar, similar to the approach that already exists for banking supervision or competition policy. However, a range of different views has, have, has emerged from seeking mere improvement to the current approach aiming at convergence of national supervisory practices, changes in the governance of ESMA, and opt-in for, uh, for firms to choose EU-level supervision on a voluntary basis or a two-speed approach, that is a centralized supervision among a coalition of willing member states. Therefore, there could be hardly a better time uh, just after the EU election and before the next commission takes office to discuss the, bef the benefit of common capital market intervention and the various approaches that could lead us there. Um, on the panel today to discuss uh, this important topic, we have uh, five experts with a range of high relevant expertise coming from the public sector, the market, and the civil society. Let me introduce them, starting from my right, going um, all the way down <clears throat> the panel. Um, we have first Nicolas Veron with us. Nicolas is a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute and, of course, co-founder and senior fellow at Bruegel. He recently published an analysis on the state of play of the CMU, including concrete far-reaching proposal on supervision integration. Next to him, we have Verena. Verena, and uh, she is the chair of the European Security and Market Authority before joining ESMA uh, as the first executive director of it uh, at its inception. She held various senior positions in the UK financial service authorities. Next to her, 
We have um, Alexandra uh, Monczynska. Did I get right? Good. I, I exercised all morning, so that was not was not by chance. Managing Director of the European Federation of Investor and Financial Services User, better known as Better Finance. Then we have um, Pat Lardner, who is uh, the Chief Executive to the Irish Fund Industry Association, the representative body of the International Invent Investment Fund community in Highland. And last but not least, we have Stefan Buzna, CEO and Chairman of the, and of the Managing Director Board of Euronext, the company responsible for running exchanges in Paris, London, Amsterdam, among others. So, um, before getting to, uh, to the, to the um, specific question, just some housekeeping. So, we will have three rounds of questions. First round of question: the panelists have four min five minutes to answer. In the second and third round, they have just two, three minutes, because this should leave us some room to ask, to, to have some question from the audience, both the, uh, those that are present here and online. So let's jump into the, to the very first round of question. So before we delve into a single capital market supervisor, how how the single um, market supervisor could look like and how we get there, let's uh, take a step back and look at why we are discussing this in the first place. So I would like to ask to the panelists a generic question and then specific question to each of them. So the, the most general question is, what do you think is missing right now in terms of supervisory convergency and integration? And um, what would be the benefit, what would the benefit of a single supervisor be? Let me start with Verena. Verena. What are the limitations HESMA currently face in carrying out its mandate and what benefit would there be to expand HESMA power? So Verena, you have five minutes. I Thank you very much. I'll keep the time. Thank you, Piero, and uh, uh, thank you very much for having me here today. It's great to actually have a conference where we focus specifically on this topic. It's clearly very topical. It's more and more discussed. But let me, as you suggested, maybe take a step back first and think where we've come from. So when ESMA was first created over a decade ago, we really, in the beginning, focused a lot on making sure that we had consistent understanding of the rule book. So we worked a lot on actually creating common rules, common guidance, common views of what actually the rules mean, and then try to implement that consistently. I think with time, we have seen that that only takes us so far. So we then said we need to move beyond that and more expand our supervisory convergence work. And as part of that, we've really looked at how is supervision actually conducted on the ground and what in particular areas are the things where we still have divergence of how actually supervision is done in different national competent authorities. And the aim was to ultimately make supervision more efficient and more effective. So, and I think we've advanced quite a bit on that. Um, we have certainly uh, have now an expanded toolkit with the new ESMA regulation in 2019. We got some additional tools, such as uh, union uh, strategic supervisory priorities, where we basically focus all of our efforts as the national authorities on one particular risk or issue where we believe we need to really have a consolidated and common approach. Um, we've also developed a number of more in-house tools, I would call them, where we basically went beyond that and looked at, for example, voluntary um, colleges or common supervisory actions, where we basically, on a voluntary basis, get the NCAs together and say, look, we believe this is really a common issue where we need to all make sure that we focus on and we look at. And so that has proven actually quite effective and has certainly hugely enhanced the cooperation and collaborative efforts amongst the NCAs. I think when it comes to the constraints that are there, 
the reality is that in the end, all of that convergence effort relies on the ability and the willingness of individual national competent authorities mm -hmm. to join in that common undertaking, which in the vast majority of cases they very much want, but the reality is also they always have competing national demands on what might be more important in their country, and therefore it is an additional effort to make sure you have the right capacity and resources to look at the European-wide risks in a consolidated way. So I think it's clear that extensive convergence work is a real challenge to deliver on both for national competent authorities and for ESMA, just in terms of capacity and uh, ability. I think the other thing that we need to recognize is that there are limits on how far convergence work can go. We rely ultimately on the goodwill and the abilities of the national competent authorities and their uh, ability to operate on a timely and effective manner to take care of specific supervisory risks. And while we can push in that direction or there, the reality is it remains in the hands of the national authorities. And with that, there are different cultures, there are different approaches to how to deal with certain things, which will always mean that even if you have the best single rule book, the outcome that you get in the end is hard to align really completely. And as you said, Piero, the reality is that we have challenges with increasing cross-border business and how do we make sure that that interconnected cross-border business can be supervised in a way that is genuinely uh, joint and a close cooperative way. And that's why ESMA in its recent position paper on how to build an effective and attractive market has very much focused also not just on thinking about what do we need as a single supervisor and in which areas potentially, but really also how can we, for the vast majority of areas where national supervision will stay, where it will remain at national level, how can we further drive the convergence efforts? And there it's about more joint supervisory work. It is about maybe giving some more central um, uh, assistance through ESMA in data collection and analysis, whether that comes to having risk identifiers that can then help the supervisors to focus on the right issues at national level, or whether that is, for example, in common market surveillance efforts. All of that we need to continue to drive. The continued focus on convergence will be important, whatever we do on the wider framework for supervision. And maybe I stop here. Thank you, perfect timing. So, Alexandra, from the perspective of citizen and retail investor, what do you see as the current gap in supervision and, and where um, could a single supervisor help? Thank you. First of all, uh, thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting a representative of uh, retail investors and citizens to this discussion. Uh, in fact, maybe for those who are not familiar with Better Finance, we are a federation of member organizations. We have uh, member organizations, most of the European member states, and their individual members are individual uh, investors, so retail investors. Um, maybe because you ask us to take a step back, I would just take maybe even additional one step back, because for retail investors, extremely important to this discussion is the context. And of course, the idea of single supervisor comes not from nowhere. We would like simply to see the CMU progressing. It is not for the last decade. The outcomes for retail investors are poor. We have seen recently some statements and reports uh, that uh, uh, complain in a certain way about the uh, situation in which retail investors uh, do keep their savings on the bank accounts and don't invest them. One of the reasons for that is, of course, value for money that we are not going to discuss here today. But, of course, value for money that at the end of the day the investors get is connected to how well the, the supervision uh, of the financial entities is working. Um, and we have done also a bit of research. Uh, we, I mean, Better Finance with our member organizations. And it's pretty clear from this research and also from the annual report that we publish on the real return of the uh, long-term and pension savings, that the outcomes for consumers are not uh, good. When it comes to the key gaps in the EU financial supervision, so we see many of those gaps. It's uh, fragmentation of regulatory standards. It leads to inconsistencies in the application of financial regulation. 
and uh, it is creating an uh, even um, a playing field. We have insufficient cross-border uh, cooperation, so a lot is happening cross-border. Financial markets are increasingly uh, interconnected, but there is no really um, a mechanism that would allow for a seamless cooperation between different national um, uh, bodies. Uh, we have also complexity of regulatory uh, environment, and uh, this is uh, also a problem for retail investors that would like to invest and invest and understand also a little better how it works, and especially for those that would like to invest cross-border. And also we see gaps when it comes to enforcement of financial regulation and also uh, the imposition of penalties. We have some member states where the national uh, competent authorities are pretty um, vigorous and others that are being criticized for not doing enough or, for example, um, imposing fines that are quite often the minimal fines that you could actually impose for some regulatory breaches. Um, for retail investors, the, the problem uh, is, of course, when you look um, for some emerging issues like crypto, when they also saw different approaches in different member states and quite diversified uh, framework. Um, when it comes to the greenwashing in financial services, because we also have seen different approaches in the member states and different, uh, I would say, it, um, interest in, in tackling some of the issues that, uh, that uh, appeared. And we also had different scandals that have even more um, uh, disposed and, and showed um, the supervisory failures. One of them is uh, Wirecard, and here some of the academics also say that this example is in fact a textbook example for how and why a single uh, supervisory authority would be better and how in fact um, a supervisory authority that is the closest to the local market and should have the more insights was in fact not taking into account that much the interest of retail investors and investors in general, but rather protecting an entity that could have been seen as, as a national champion. So we see, of course, that those kind of gaps uh, could be addressed by a single supervisor. And especially when you look at the detriment that this is causing to retail investors, some academies have been trying to quantify the adverse impact of these supervisory gaps on individual investors. And according to some, this inconsistent regulatory environment in the EU can increase the cost of investment product by up to 2% annually due to diverse inefficiencies. Um, so we would see that uh, definitely there is a, a space and a role for a single supervisory body to address th those gaps, but only on the one condition, such a body would be really effective and efficient. And uh, then we would say that they, this body could be able to, to really uh, offer some um, solutions and uh, address these gaps by providing a unified regulatory framework and some oversight uh, mechanism. But I suppose that maybe we'll have time uh, a bit later to, to go into details on how such body could look like. Thank you. Perfect timing as well. So let's move to Stefan. Stefan, as a cross-border group of stock exchange, Euronext is advocating for EU level supervision. What challenges does fragmented national supervision create for Euronext and what benefit would a single supervisory supervisor brings for Euronext? Uh, thank you for your <coughs> invitation. Um, as you said, Euronext has a particular perspective and on that particular point on single supervision, we change our mind. During the high-level forum initiated by the European Commission at the beginning of the previous cycle, we advocated a sort of convergence and uh, upgrade the status quo, whatever, and we radically changed our mind over the past uh, year or so for the following reason. Your next comes with an history of a relatively smooth uh, cooperation within supervisors. We are supervised by the College of Supervisors that operate on a, on a federal mode with a rotating chair, and we operate seven regulated uh, trading venues in, in Norway, in, uh, in, in the Netherlands, in Belgium, in France, in Portugal, in Ireland, in, uh, in, uh, in Italy. Uh, we operate four CSDs in Portugal, in Italy, in Denmark, in Norway. We operate one clearinghouse in Italy, which has a European uh, uh, reach now. And, uh, and we operate various MTFs uh, all over Europe. And, um, and this College of Supervisors works pretty well. 
the problem is that um, the single liquidity pool we operate, the single order book we operate, the single technology platform, which is, which is by the way, pretty large, huh? because uh, over the years, uh, we have now uh, average daily volumes of equity trading of uh, 10 to 11 billion euro per day, which is twice the size of equity trading in London. Uh, we have aggregate market capitalizations of companies listed on Euronext market of about 7 trillion euro, which is again twice the size of the aggregate market capitalizations of companies listed in London. So it's a pretty large integrated European market. But um, even if it, if it works uh, okay, um, uh, it's, it's, it's not optimal and it, 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 it doesn't converge. And just, just a parenthesis here, I just want to to insist on the fact that we are talking a lot about framework, regulation, etc. But the core priority for all of us should be what uh, uh, Mr. Hanani mentioned earlier today, which is how to get more equity. Uh, and and the, 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 the real project should be mega, make equity great again. And, uh, and that that's the, should be all priority because really you can do whatever a very nice uh, uh, dress uh, if you don't have uh, uh, the bride, I don't know how you can get to any marriage. So, so it's really, really important to focus on. Now, why, why, why is this situation today not optimal? Uh, just because of a fragmentation. In reality, you have 27 uh, national supervisors, and in some countries you have a financial market. In some countries you have zero financial market. So the reality is that you have national authorities that don't know what they are talking about because nothing is happening locally. I mean, the voice of Slovakia to discuss European fishing policy is important and interesting, as is the voice of uh, the Czech Republic to discuss the European fishing policy. But the reality is that there are some countries that are so small and that are pure buyers of, of, of finance that, that they don't have the critical size to handle complex issues. And you have, on the other hand, uh, countries that have very complex issues. So there is a reality which is a big gap in terms of understanding and relevance of the market because finance is not distributed in an even manner. Second, you have a different of culture. Some national regulators are obsessed by one single thing, which is the rule of law and applying only the relevant rules. Other national supervisors see their role as being the Ministry of Capital Markets and as steering the, the uh, and have somehow a delegated authority from the local ecosystem to, to shape and influence the development of capital markets. That's very different. In some uh, NCAs, you have that the, the leaders are, are, are quasi judges or very senior uh, experts. In other NCAs, you have, uh, you have politically appointed people who have been defeated at the previous elections. So, because it doesn't matter at the end of the day, whether you have Mr. X or Mrs. V. So the reality is a fundamental fragmentation of knowledge mandate. In it. So if you want to buy powerful integrated capital markets in Europe, we cannot live with that type of supervision. And again, there are two, they are very extreme on, on both sides. The second thing is that um, the reality is that uh, uh, the, the, the local supervisors do a one size fits all job because it's very different from the banking supervisions. The banking supervision supervise banks, but the market capital market authorities supervise issuers, asset managers, market infrastructures, to, to, to mention the main, the main clients of them. And this is a totally different world. So the discussion about what we need to integrate a supervision is not the same. I'm not suggesting that we should have a federal agency where every single supervision of every single company's compliance with relevant corporate law in terms of stock exchange law should be centralized. For sure, issuers supervision should be remain local because it's so much embedded in corporate law, which is not federal, that there is no point doing. For asset managers, the debate is a bit more balanced and clearly for the ones who have a multi-country uh, uh, operations that should be, that should be uh, federalized. And for sure, I believe, for market infrastructure, we need some form of consistency. And one last point at this level, we should not distinguish uh, too quickly the, 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 the need of single interpretation, because by one single body, and the need to proceed in parallel to single rule book. Because when rules are similar, 
they are different. And gold plating is consubstantial, is, is unavoidable when you, when you go to the directive route. So the single rule is as important as the single application. So uh, I, I do believe that uh, we have no choice, at least, at least for the ones, all the ones who are multi-country operators. Thank you. Now let's move to our fourth speaker, Pat. There has uh, long been some resistance in Ireland to the idea of strengthening EU level supervision in capital markets. Can you share your perspective on this issue with us? Thanks. So thank you for the, the invitation to, to participate today. Um, for those of you who don't know who Irish funds are, so we're the, the voice of the funds and asset management industry in Ireland. We have 150 member firms. Um, the vision that we have is that we actually would be a premier, the premier location to enable global investing by having a reputation for trust, capability and innovation, all of which will be important, I think, through the debate that we go through. Um, I, I was a little surprised by the question, actually, because I'd say in Ireland, um, at both the citizens level and an institutional level, we've been amongst the strongest supporters of, of the EU. Um, we have long been advocates of strong, effective and converge, converged regulation and the pivotal role that ESMA has played in that. Indeed, when we responded to the Commission's targeted consultation back in 2021, with precision, we were very clear as to the areas where we felt that ESMA has and continues to bring real value. That obviously works in conjunction with the very active program that our national competent authority has. And I'd say that, you know, again, just reacting to the initial part of the question, then going back to the broader one, um, a level playing field is something that is absolutely welcomed by us because, one, it's important for CMU. Two, it's important for better choices for end investors and for their outcomes, as I think we've been talking about earlier on. And also, it offers a consistency of approach. So I think that the fact that we see there being a very strong benefit in an approach to regulation and to supervision, which is consistent, that doesn't automatically mean that we jump to that a single supervisor is necessarily the way to do it or the priority. Now, why would I say that? So the reason I'd say that is actually to come back to, well, what's the nature of the problem that we're trying to solve? And this conference is actually rooted in financial integration. So financial integration, I think, as the ECB itself has helpfully helped to outline, what does it mean? It actually means that you effectively get uh, financial services are available under the same rules and the same conditions for all the countries that use the euro. So let's break that down into availability. So what is available at the moment to all citizens? So I would say in terms of solutions, we have very credible, very reputable solutions for end investors in, in done via a European construct, USITs, AFES, and more recently LTIFs. And actually, we're going to talk about a number of issues, including competitiveness. And actually, th these regimes, in particular USITs, is an internationally recognized regime that brings capital from outside of the Union into the European Union as well. So I think we definitely have the solutions. Now, the question is whether or not those solutions are getting access and are getting to the end investor. I think that speaks more to conditions, which I'll come back to. Um, in terms of the rules, well, we do have, and I know there are, will be different views. We actually have a very well-established set of rules, same rules. We actually have very, very active revision of those rules in terms of making improvements. And we've also seen that the powers, as, as Verena has outlined, have been expanded, whether they be around remediation, preparation, or implementation. I do think in terms of rules, one of the things to impact integration is how do we look at the sequencing between rules being regulated and legislated for and then adopted? Because that has an impact also on the end investor. In terms of conditions, I think ultimately this is where I would probably focus. And first condition that we have to have for financial integration is do we have the capital? As Alexandra has said, we actually have the capital. We have, and we need to activate about 41% of the average European household balance sheet is sitting on deposit. So therefore, the question is, if we have the capital, what are the other conditions that need to be created? I think access is definitely one. I think we need to acknowledge the fact that we are starting from different cultural starting points. And I don't mean that at the level of the regulators. I mean that at the level of the populations. I came from Poland yesterday, where they are actually at a different stage of their journey. And actually how we make sure that we bring different groups of citizens along is going to be very important. 
And I think that there's also a piece around literacy, but this question, are we actually encouraging citizens to engage with financial services? Why should they invest? Because ultimately, in all the discussion that we're having about capital markets union, we're talking about other people's money. There has to be a strong feeling that both from policymakers, regulators, and industry, that there are very good reasons why they should do it. So in conclusion, I think that we can and should be focusing on the conditions as a priority. I absolutely would acknowledge that there is more that can be built on the already great work that ESMA and the national competent authorities are doing. But given the fact that we have many different things going on here, what exactly is the priority and what will yield the best and most enduring results? Thank you. Thank you very much. Finally, we go to Nicolas. Nicolas, in your recent paper, you explained that a single rule book is not sufficient to make a single market and that supervisory architecture is crucial. Can you elaborate on what you see as the key benefit criteria and success of a single supervisor com compared with multi uh, the current setup? Well, first, thanks uh, a lot to the European Central Bank and the European Commission for having me here. Uh, having me here. It's very inspiring for me to uh, speak here about supervisory integration in capital markets and what I view as a sanctuary of integrated supervision in general, uh, because it's still the home um, of uh, European banking supervision um, until moving uh, to the other side of the street uh, next year. Um, I need to make a few disclosures. Uh, I'm um, an independent non-executive director of the trade repository of uh, DTCC, which includes an entity which is supervised by ESMA. Uh, I'm not speaking today in that capacity, let me be very clear, and I don't view it as a conflict of interest. I'm also a member of the Scientific Council of Better Finance, um, uh, but that's not a conflict either. Some of what I will say will overlap with, uh, with some of what has already been said, I'll try to minimize that. So first thing I want to say is that we're talking about the uh, shortcomings of failures, but a lot has been achieved. I have a vivid recollection of a comment made by Fabrice de Marigny, the old timers will remember him as the Secretary General of the Committee of European Securities Regulators, the predecessor of ESMA, uh, and he was instrumental in uh, what uh, was called, I think, the Himalaya report, because it looked like it would be very difficult to achieve uh, in the 2000s. And when the legislation establishing ESMA was published, uh, we invited him at Bruegel to comment on the legislation, and I remember him really vividly, he said, it's a dream come true. So he felt the Himalaya had been uh, conquered. Uh, it was uh, kind of maybe not the end of the road, but uh, basically the real deal. Now we view it differently because, as you said, uh, there has been a lot of learning along the way, but I think we should remember this is part of a longer journey. Having said that, after 10 years of uh, Capital Markets Union uh, being coined by Jean-Claude Juncker um, in July 2014, uh, we did indeed observe, uh, as uh, you just said, that uh, regulatory harmonization isn't enough. And I, I, I won't elaborate uh, for a very long time on this, but I think a good illustration was given by Mr. Koblitz uh, earlier today. He said, you know, you get the prospectus authorization uh, or, or an issuing authorization in one member state, and it's not recognized in another. Uh, is that in line with the uh, text of the legislation? Probably not. Does the European Commission uh, open an infringement proceeding? Probably not. So uh, this is too much at a low level under the radar for uh, this to become an issue for heads of state and government or even legislators, but for market participants, it's their daily life. And you can say that across a range of authorization procedures and you know enforcement mechanisms and all the things that securities uh, authorities do. So basically, the obstacles are hidden. They're not hidden in plain sight. They're hidden in the experience of market participants, but market participants, for obvious reasons, also don't have an, in an incentive to go very public about meeting those problems. And, uh, and therefore, I think this explains why um, you know, supervisory integration would be catalytic and why uh, reformers really need to focus on this uh, issue if they want to achieve something in comparison to the kind of scattershot approach we have had seen to capital markets union uh, in the last 10 years. So the point here is that super, uh, all these activities are regulated and supervised for a reason. I'm not advocating deregulation. 
but supervision shapes markets. Supervision shapes markets. If you have uh, fragmented supervision, you will have a uh, fragmented market. So what are the criteria for su success? Um, I think, you know, supervisory effectiveness is kind of a vague notion, but it captures what we want to see. We want this supervision to be effective. We want a level playing field, of course. We want them to be independent. We want them to have resources uh, in order to be able to fulfill their mission. We also want to minimize the administrative, uh, you know, bureaucratic overlap with the NCAs, which means, by the way, that in some areas, the transfer has to be pretty comprehensive. Uh, you know, rating agencies or trade repositories is a good example. This was a blank slate. There was nothing before it was introduced, and therefore, as does everything, so NCAs are not involved at all. So that works in terms of minimizing bureaucratic, um, you know, uh, burden. But uh, but for uh, market segments where you have an established uh, infrastructure, of course, it's more difficult. I will add one thing, and I stop there on what we want from an integrated supervisor. We wanted to understand the markets. We wanted to have connectivity with the markets without being captured uh, by market participants. And we'll come back to this, I think, in the, uh, later in this debate, because I think this has very important implications in the design of a successful uh, integrated capital market su supervisor for Europe. Thank you. Thank you. With this, we have <clears throat> concluded the first round of questions. Now we move to the second round. We will have one question for each panelist, and we will focus on the scope of supervised entities. Uh, I remind that you, you guys have three minutes to answer to the question, and I hope you will be disciplined as you have been so far, so that we can have some time for questions from the public. So. A recent paper, statement, papers and, re, and report on CMU have highlighted very different level of ambition and ideas about which entities should be included in the scope of supervision. Question for Verena. In its recent uh, report on Capital Market Union, ESMA proposed evaluating whether specific areas of EU capital markets may benefit from EU supervision based on a criteria such as cross-border or pan-European dimension. Would you see the single supervisory mechanism as a possible model for capital market supervision where an EU level authority would be responsible for the supervision of systemic cross-border actors? Or um, are you considering other models such as that of competing uh, policy, which Benoit Couré recently suggested could inspire capital market supervision. Back to you, three minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's a big question for three minutes, but I'll do my best. I think uh, the success of the SSM uh, is clearly an example that we should uh, look at. At the same time, I also believe that we need to think about what capital markets actually need. And, and I very much share what Stefan said. I think we should remember that capital market supervision is, however, different from banking supervision. So I think we need to look what is the right model for the specific cases that we are looking at. And uh, clearly, there's no one model that necessarily might even work for the whole of the capital market sector. Nicola was referring to it, even for the uh, mandates that ESMA currently has direct supervisory responsibilities for, we actually have slightly different models. In some cases, it's basically grown out of uh, a completely blank sheet where we are directly supervising firms exclusively. NCAs have no further supervisory powers. Then there are other mandates where it is actually shared responsibility. So, for example, when it comes to data reporting service providers, where some, the bigger ones, are supervised at ESMA level, the smaller local ones at local level. Then we have others where we have a complementary role with the national competent authorities. So, for example, when it comes to trade repositories and the reporting entities that report into the trade repositories. So we have really a different kind of setups. And I think we need to remember that diversity to find the right and most efficient and effective way of actually bringing the supervision together. And there have been clearly different debates. You mentioned it, Piero, um, different ideas put forward. I think uh, from my perspective, 
and what we put into the ESMA position paper was very much to focus first of all, all which are the areas where it would make sense and then let's look at what would be the right model to do so. And the criteria for where it would make sense clearly is based on significant pan-European business. That's clearly where it is most efficient and most effective to move to that level. Um, and I think in that case, what we put as examples were market infrastructures, post-trading or exchanges, we also proposed potentially crypto asset service providers where actually at the moment we are building 27 times supervisory regimes in each country for a completely new set of market players. Seems not very efficient to my mind. So I think we could have done that better maybe. And then I think, as I said previously, for the vast majority of areas, I would still see national supervisors very much in the lead and uh, working with ESMA and driving forward convergence on that national supervision and making sure we try to do things even more effectively together. Thank you. So, no so let's move to, to, to Nicolas. Um, Nicolas, you have argued that the, the areas of market infrastructure and, re, and the reporting requirement are those that should be most urgently placed under the centralized supervision. Um, while uh, investment fund and prospectuses could be left for a future stage, can you explain what considerations uh, supported this prioritization and how and how I and why did you come to this conclusion? Well, I'll try, uh, but actually, there is a sequencing point that to me is much more important than that. And this is a fact, uh, and this is absolutely not a judgment on the excellent work that uh, Verena and her colleagues are doing at ESMA. But I think bef before expanding uh, the um, responsibilities of ESMA, I think ESMA needs significant reform because it has not been designed to be an independent supervisor. And I think irrespective of the quality of the staff, irrespective of the quality of the work, there are fundamental obstacles to supervisory effectiveness of ESMA as a supervisor, as long as its buildup, its governance, its funding, its design are not uh, significantly reformed. Let me make it very clear that I'm not speaking uh, in uh, my capacity as a, a, an independent director of a supervised entity here, completely different approach, but only as a, a, an external observer. Um, so ESMA needs a new governance. It needs a new funding model. Fortunately, there is a model for that. If you look at what the European Union has just decided for the EU Anti-Money Laundering Authority, which, uh, for which the legislation has just been uh, finally approved, uh, it may even be published, uh, and uh, it will be implemented in the next few months, I think this is a perfect blueprint for what we need at ESMA. So we need, don't need to reinvent something here. We have a blueprint which is based on European experience of you know, the single resolution board, the single supervisory mechanism, competition policy, what have you. Uh, and it can be transposed uh, to what we need for capital market supervision. By the way, I don't think you need that immediately for insurance. Uh, the EBA, of course, is in a different space. So really focus on ESMA. Now, having said that, and I will still answer your question, um, why did I single out market infrastructure and corporate reporting or uh, requirements? Because I think they're very simple to explain in terms of subsidiarity. And here I can only, on market infrastructure, expand on what Stefan uh, said earlier in this panel. But I think if you think of uh, critical significance, including for financial stability purposes, by the way, uh, if you think in terms of interoperability, which was mentioned this morning, and in the case of reporting requirements, very simply, if you think of comparability, which is the basic reason we have those requirements, because we want to be able to compare from one firm to another, uh, irrespective of the country, uh, it's very easy to understand why supervision uh, of these matters need to be integrated. Thank you. So let's go back again to, to Stefan. What would be your perspective on a model where larger, <clears throat> largest trading venues, including Euronext, would be subject to EU-wide uh, supervisor, single supervisor, while smaller national exchange would remain under national supervision? 
would you then uh, be concerned that national supervisors would uh, have additional uh, reason to create obstacles to consolidation? You, you kind of answered to this in the previous round, but then you, you have a chance to... No, but l let me be maybe more specific and uh, a sort of benchmark analysis with the, with the banking supervision is useful. Um, just like in the banking supervision, making a difference between what is systemic in the banking supervision, what is pan-European in terms of reach or action in our case, basically where consistency is needed, is one key metric. So if a local market infrastructure, which is purely local, decides that what is good for them is to be super connected with local specificities, why not? Uh, but for any uh, market infrastructure that is operating in various countries, depending as, irrespective as to whether it's a bottom-up construct as or system where we are aggregating several exchanges that are bottom-up consolidation, or whether it's a top-down project like uh, uh, CBOE, which is incorporated in one single uh, country in the, in the Netherlands, but operating across Europe, I mean, we believe that consistency of supervision uh, to create a proper level playing field is important. So it's similar to the notion of uh, systemic, non-systemic being relevant at the European level, or I wouldn't say relevant, and, and then everyone would, would choose. Second uh, uh, difference, I covered it uh, clearly by nature, some, 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 some activities like the supervision and regulation of, uh, of issuers would have, to, in my view, to, to remain local. One, one last uh, comment about uh, where the uh, uh, banking supervision could be an option. Clearly, the, uh, the governance of ESMA today is, uh, is uh, inspired by the fact that it's a, a talking uh, body, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a body that produces level two or level three uh, pieces of, 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 of regulations. It's a coordination body, it's a peer group, but it's not effective in terms of supervising uh, large entities. To this, in this respect, the governance model of the, of the ECB and the SSM is a relevant one. Uh, we need to have around the table an executive board which is much more compact, which takes decision, and uh, a consulting uh, body which is relevant but only for non-executive decision because it, we can't have uh, uh, the, um, the, the fiction of, uh, of, of some, uh, some uh, national uh, competent authority feeling uh, having, having, having a say in decision whether or not they have a financial market or not, and whether they understand the issues. I mean, I remember very precisely the debates in during the COVID crisis on the ban on short selling. There was a fundamental intellectual debate as to whether or not short selling on, on equity should be, should be banned. Some countries felt that it, was, uh, it had to be banned because it was good for issuers. Others said no, because intellectually we believe that it's bad for markets and that even short selling is part of a, of a, a fundamental investment decision. And in any event, it's banning short selling is bad for investors. So ultimately, there was a debate between the ones who thought it was what is good for investors, what is good for issuers. That's okay. But there were many other national competent authority who had no clue about what uh, what's all about. And, and we need to have a situation where fundamental issues in crisis times can be solved. But in, the, in this particular safe case, the view of uh, within ESPA didn't make any sense because it was a national decision at the anyway. But we need, we need to find a way to, to, to have a compact decision making similar to the, to, to, to the ECB one, which is not inconsistent with the fact that on a regular basis, you have a consultation uh, of, of all the relevant countries. To, to Pat. So, Pat, uh, Christian Noyer recently published a report <clears throat> that was requested by the French Treasury, and this paper suggested that uh, asset managers could submit themselves to the direct supervision by ESMA under an opt-in arrangement on a voluntary basis, which uh, would in turn offer more effective passporting rights across the EU. 
Would this uh, sort of setup help overcome the objection some market actors have to single supervision? What do you think? Thank you. Well, I mean, I think something, and if I didn't say this strongly enough earlier on, I should have, that the, the amount of comments and reports that we've had to try and activate investment is actually really positive, and we should be making sure that we capture that momentum. Um, I do think in all of the reports that we've seen, it's interesting, the perspective of the owners of the capital are less prominent, which I would like to see that happening more. Um, and also in all of the various reports, whether it be the Noye report or others, we variously have integrated sufficient, integrated supervision, comprehensive oversight powers, convergence and efficiency of supervision, supervisory convergence, single supervisor model, larger supervisory mandate. We've got about 20 different terms. And I think it's really about trying to figure out which ones are, are the best ones. I, I would say that when we look at it, and, and I'll comment specifically on Noe, that line, that straight line between supervision and the contention that it will deliver capital markets is very difficult for us to see that line being drawn. I would say positively in terms of the report, which was very detailed, I think it comments on supervisory colleges, which have been effective. We've seen supervisory coordination network, I think has been very, very good. And it should re reflect really the reality that we have that already activities have been distributed around the union for, for very good reason in many cases. I think Noye also points out that the ability to have forbearance provisions because the implementation path is important. So whether that be no action letters or some of the sequencing points that I made. The point on interoperability and reporting I think is very important. That is a key enabler to build trust, to build understanding, to build transparency. So I would definitely see that the reporting obligations increasing and we've seen obviously that change more recently under AI, FMD and USITS. I think that will help no end with where we're going. Where I would challenge though, and I, and I would challenge the fact that it, it is suggesting in the report that national approach, approaches are a consequence of supervision. I, I do not believe that's the case. So for example, if one was to say that in the absence of supervision that, you know, in the absence of national supervision, if you had central supervision, that it would ease the problems. If I'm setting up a private equity fund to invest in European SMEs, and I want to distribute it, I will come across uh, if I want to distribute it to the insurance sector in one particular country, if I want to get tax benefits in another country, I will run into difficulties. They have nothing got to do with supervision. They actually have to do with underlying structure. So I think it's important that we're clear about where the impediments are and where the impediments aren't. Um, because clearly all of, you still have to comply with all of the national regulation. I think that there was this point about opt-ins and uh, as being kind of effective for supervision. So if we're saying that if you have an opt-in to central supervision, that that's going to be better than existing passports, isn't that a more comment about the operation of the existing passports rather than creating potentially a two-tier system? And that is, I think, a risk here. Um, because ultimately what we're looking for is a greater harmonization right across the board. The objections finally, and I'll, I'll try and be brief, that you say that come from market participants, they're not necessarily principled just because we're talking about single supervision. So their objectives, their object, objectives, excuse me, and this happens whether we're talking in Ireland or I talk to my colleagues around Europe, they want consistent and converged rules. There isn't the same equivalent support for single supervision because we're in an environment as was discussed at the very start of the panel today. We've had higher inflation, it's, higher, it's harder to generate risk-adjusted returns net of fees. So therefore, if one adds on potentially another level of costs, another level of reporting, what are you doing to diminish those? And I would say finally that, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about comparisons with single supervisory mechanism. And I know we've had comments about the SEC. I think we gotta be careful that we're not attributing a benefit from one model created for one purpose to another set of circumstances. That I think is worth discussing a bit more. Great. So let's move to Alexandra. So Alexandra, focusing on the single supervision of the largest, largest wholesale actor makes sense from a financial stability perspective and could be more uh, political feasible, but it could leave entities that cater for retail investor for which investor protection is a key supervisory concern within the remit 
of national supervisors. Is this something you are concerned about and how could this be addressed? Thank you. Uh, and, and thank you also for, for many uh, good comments uh, done by previous speakers and especially to Pat for uh, again underlining uh, that the discussion should be a bit more uh, revolving about uh, around the, the owners of capital, also the access to, to good products, and um, this is also very important. Uh, we, we see the point, so Better Finance uh, really tries to be pragmatic. We had, uh, we think, some good proposals how to improve the access to good products. Uh, as we have seen in the recent um, uh, discussions on the EU level, there was not enough uh, political willingness, there was not enough uh, courage to, to follow up on that. Um, when it comes to the focus on the wholesale, we, we do see the point. So, as, as also Verena said, uh, the focus on significant pan-European business, as uh, also Nicolas mentioned, uh, wholesale actors, of course, have significant uh, cross-border operations and are more likely to pose uh, uh, systemic risks. So, having a dedicated um, supervisory focus to ensure that those large, systemically important institutions are monitored rigorously, we do see the point. We also see the point of the subsidiarity principle. And, um, but saying that, we do also see and we do hear some concerns uh, that would um, be entailed with this, uh, this approach. And uh, so in some discussions that we had also with different stakeholders, we did hear concerns about the neglect of, of retail investors. So focus on the wholesale actors leading to insufficient uh, retail attention to retail investor protection. Uh, the dual supervisory framework, of course, could create some further inconsistencies and gaps that we were saying at the beginning of our discussions we would like to address with the single supervisory body. Um, investor confidence was one of the points that, uh, that was uh, raised. Um, and um, yeah, the, the concern that the retail investors' confidence could be undermined uh, with the focus of single supervisory body only on the uh, wholesale uh, issues. Well, I've discussed also resource allocation, so the concern that uh, in, the, uh, in the focus of the single supervisory body on the uh, wholesale, the resources could be diverted then from the national supervisory uh, authorities. I'm not sure if I exactly see, uh, see this. But in, in this setup, I would say that uh, also drawing the inspiration, in fact, from the competition policy and how this system works maybe would not be bad. Because, in fact, there you do have one central, very strong um, body and you have many um, uh, authorities in the member states. And it is fact that 90% of the decisions there are taken by the national competent authorities. But let's not forget that there was also a huge effort in this uh, uh, area of, of the European policy to have those national competent authorities at the same uh, level in terms of um, uh, supervisory toolbox, enforcement, uh, resources, independence issues, so there's whole directive fo focus and really directed at making them equally, uh, I would say, um, efficient and effective. Thank you, thank you. Then let's move to this third round of questions, one question for each panelist, and we will focus on uh, supervisory architecture and governance. There are there are different approaches that could be taken to achieve single supervision, both in terms of the respective power and responsibility of national and EU supervisor, and in terms of the governance of the EU supervisor itself. So let's start from Pat again. <clears throat> in your view, Pat, uh, how could the single supervision be set up in such a way that it caters for the specific needs of each national market. Can there be fully harmonized supervisory practices without a single supervisor? Please, Pat, three minutes. Thank you. Um, so, listen, I think given my comments earlier on, I'll probably focus a bit more on, on harmonization. As I said, I came from Poland yesterday, and they're at a different stage of their journey. But I think it's important when we're putting this together to realize that we have to make sure we bring the citizens of the union along. And if we don't, there will be both economic and political costs that down the line, particularly because we're talking about their money funding the collective issues that we need to face. I would be of a view uh, that harmonizing practices is definitely achievable. 
I think ESMA have demonstrated that. I think, you know, we've seen 29 peer reviews. So there is definitely an ability to do that. Um, I would re-echo the point about data and using that to support governance. I think we probably tend to forget as well that the system really goes far beyond what we see in other elements of the single market. And I think to the comparisons about the single supervisory mechanism, and let me preface this by saying I'm not an expert in banking, but the single supervisory mechanism was created obviously to make sure that systemic risks were addressed. I think it is clearly open to question whether the single supervisory mechanism and a single regulator has created greater competition in the market and actually has created great cross-border. So if we are using that as a rationale for creating a single supervisor in the security side, I think that we probably need to see a little bit more evidence of that actually happening. Um, and I think from the SEC has been mentioned elsewhere. So the question I would ask is, do we have greater retail participation in the United States because the SEC was created in 1934? or because the 401k was created, which has given rise to retail participation? I think the answer is the latter. I haven't done the numbers, but I'd be pretty confident. And I think ultimately, um, when we come down to questions of governance or mandate, these all become quite political questions. I do think that if there was one piece that it would exist in the mandate of ESMA and all regulators, is that it is financial inclusion. And that there, as well as having a, an obligation to make sure people don't suffer by being missold something or that there's greenwashing, that there equally is a compulsion both in the design and the delivery of regulation that people must engage with the financial services community because the risks to them if they don't are potentially greater than the risks if they're missold something. That I think would be an important part of mandate. Thank you. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective. So let's move to Alexander again. <clears throat> There has been concern that the ESMA governance make it insufficiently independent from national supervisor, and, uh, and the Commission has tried to address this in the past unsuccessfully. What change to ESMA governance do you think would allow it to perform more efficiently? Three minutes to answer to a million dollars question. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Uh, just very quickly to, to answer uh, the, the very good, I mean, interesting comment on the financial inclusion. We would still think that to make the, the, the CMU and, and investing in capital markets and in general in the EU more relevant to consumers, uh, access to independent good advice would be even more, more important, but it's of course connected to financial inclusion. Uh, yes, indeed, we do have, of course, uh, concerns over uh, ESMA governments. We do appreciate and we do see a lot of good work uh, being done by ESMA and uh, trying to also improve the, the supervisory convergence and the recent uh, trying to expand the role of the um, Forum of the Senior Supervisors with the heads of enforcement uh, being there. In terms of uh, the, uh, the, the governance, of course, the, the problematic and inherently problematic issue with ESMA's governments is supervising the entities that are um, part of its supervisory board. So, of course, this uh, raises a lot of concerns and this raises a lot of problems. One of them is the influence of national interests on the final decision making um, in ESMA. Uh, there is a question, of course, on, uh, of in the independence from the national interests during the uh, decision-making process in, in, uh, in ESMA. And uh, also referring uh, partially to what also Stefan um, uh, said, uh, different, um, different entities, financial entities in the European Union, they are not evenly, uh, the activity is not evenly distributed in the member states. So, of course, quite often uh, it happens, as I can imagine, that uh, entities, uh, that the national supervisory authorities that actually are not really um, experienced, do not uh, see uh, certain activities, are in the end influential and taking, uh, taking part in the decision-making process concerning the entities that, uh, that are really problematic from the also retail investor point of view. Um, we, I, we also see the, the problem of uh, such a big supervisory board uh, having influence of um, the pace of the decision making of ESMA and um, possibly also slowing it down. Um, and what could be the solution? So um, we have already advocated for that during the ESAS reform. We would like to see more independent 
um, members of the supervisory of, of, uh, of ESMA. And here I also wanted to say actually EOPA. I mean, I know we are discussing right now ESMA, but from the retail investment point of view and the fact that EOPA is supervising such a huge uh, amount of uh, retail investment product, we would like to see the same, uh, the same uh, governance uh, improved structure in EOPA as well. And also strengthening the management board. We would see this as a very good solution uh, forward. Um, we could also uh, maybe look at EMLA, what also was referred already to, to Nicolas, because it seems to be working quite well and see how much uh, and how, how far it could be transferable to ESMA. Long term, and this is again something that Better Finance has been advocating for already during the ESAS reform, would be to have a Twin Peaks model because we really think that um, having a Twin Peaks supervisory ar architecture for the EU financial system would actually take really into account the interest of the retail investors and it would improve their situation in comparison to what we have right now. Um, so, uh, Stefan, this is for you. Um, one potential concern of market participants that they could have with the single supervision is having to interact with and pay fees to both national and the EU supervisor, which could actually increase the compliance cost and decrease efficiency. Um, are you worried about this? And what, we, what would you be the most efficient setup from your perspective? Well, I'm always worried about uh, cost, about taxes, uh, but you know, uh, the rule of law has uh, no price, but it has a cost. You have to pay people to, to do the job and to uh, uh, implement uh, supervision. And for sure, uh, the uh, end game is some form of coexistence of a federal supervisor and local uh, supervisors. And for sure, as in the case of the banking supervision, it will take time to, to clean up uh, the uh, local uh, monetary policy museums uh, and and to 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 to, to find some some specific relevance. I told, uh, I said earlier that that in the case of uh, of uh, market supervision, it will be more easy here. It will be easier, and it will be because there is an obvious role for local supervision when it comes to to issuers. But there will be a moment of of double cost that's unavoidable. Also, building uh, a federal agency that will have the power uh, and, and the bandwidth and the skills and the reactivity of the SEC will, will mean more workforce, but will mean also uh, probably, I wouldn't say better management, but a different management because uh, the, the, the core uh, mandate will move from uh, contributing to the production of regulation and drafting towards active supervision of situations. Um, so, so that's unavoidable. I think what is important, and I want to, to conclude with that, is that we focus on two things, single rule book, single rule book, single rule book. Uh, one of the best uh, output of the previous cycle is the, is the listing act with the, the, the decision to have at last uh, a sort of European S1, a single uh, prospectus and many of us are working hard to make sure that this single prospectus becomes as close as possible to an American S1 because that that will change the life of the planet in terms of investing in, in, in European companies, ACM teams, asset managers, everyone. Uh, and uh, and and the um, the second thing is, is to make sure that whatever we do, again, uh, is done without forgetting that the core solution is to make sure that we fix uh, uh, equity investments in Europe. Everyone complains about the fact that there is only 3% participation of retail investors in Europe versus 30% in the US. The explanation has nothing to do with whether or not we have a capital market union. The explanation is because in the US, when you are young, if you want to have some income, when you are old, you have to buy shares. Uh, whereas in Europe, when you are young and you want to have some income when you get old, you just have to hope that people around you will continue to pay taxes and social contributions. So that's the explanation we want between 3% and 30%. The same for asset uh, uh, managers with prudential risk. I do believe, I'm going to see Christine Lagarde later today, I will tell her the problem of Europe is not that there is too much risk in portfolios, as there was the perception in the early 2000s and mid-2000s. 
the problem of Europe is that there is not enough risk in portfolios. We have created asset management rules with, where people cannot invest in risk because everything has to be liquid and safe and, and you know, you have to, to have a life jacket, an umbrella, a belt, suspender, condoms, everything, so otherwise you cannot invest. The problem is that the explanation to the gap in the risk financing, in, in, in innovation financing between the U.S. and Europe is precisely because we need to switch the concern from there is too much risk. There was too much risk. That was the macro risk. But today there is not enough risk and therefore prudential ratios have to change. It's a big contracyclic because I'm saying that whereas at the moment where solvency is going to be published or is published in the Gazette, but the reality is that it's it's a contra-cyclical uh, measure. So making equity great again means that at the national level, at the multilateral level, we need to switch completely the rivers of investment, of savings that are today distracted to public debt and to uh, export of, uh, of, of investment into non-European asset managers. Otherwise, everything we discuss in this building will be uh, like discussing uh, the sex of the angels uh, while the Ottomans are capturing the city of Constantinople. Thank you. Thank you. This is interesting. And uh, maybe but for another time, we should discuss whether we have a preference for less risky investment or if there is something else, but this is for, for possibly another time. So um, let me move to, to Nicolas again. So Nicolas, you argue that the ESMA direct supervision should be decentralized through regional offices, but without involving staff from national authorities. Do you think this is politically real, feasible and, real, and, um, and realistic? And why uh, would this work better than involving the national authorities? Uh, thank you. To clarify, I didn't say this shouldn't involve staff from national authorities in the sense that I advocated ESMA creating local offices. It would be perfectly fine, I think, for those local officers to poach or employ staff, which currently works for national authorities. Um, Look, this is, uh, I think, a, a leitmotif of this debate is this is different from banking supervision. And again, it's appropriate that we have uh, the debate in this building. But um, it is different to, uh, at a fundamental level, as uh, uh, Alexandra and Stefan particularly have emphasized, and Pat as well. Uh, we're talking about protecting investors first. Uh, this is a conduct of business uh, supervisory challenge, mostly. There are elements of financial stability, but they are not front and center. Um, and that's different from a prudential approach. So there are many reasons why uh, we really cannot copy the design of the SSM. And I very much emphasize with what Alexandra mentioned, what we are doing is not creating a Twin Peaks in infrastructure, but the Twin Peaks infra uh, architecture, the model should be the kind of long-term horizon that we aspire to reach one day. So why is this idea of uh, local offices of ESMA uh, attractive? Uh, for reasons that are both of policy and politics. Let me take them in that order. The policy uh, rationale for having local offices is a point I mentioned earlier. You need connectivity with market participants, including those which are not in Paris. And, uh, and if your only connectivity is with the Paris-located market participants, that is a, a, a competitive distortion, so it's a bad idea. And again, we, don't have, we won't have the same supervisory model as we have here for significant institutions. You, you, maybe you can create something like a joint supervisory team for your next, that maybe would make sense, but not for, say, rating agencies or trade repositories, moving from the current exclusive uh, competence of ESMA to a joint supervisory team uh, framework would make absolutely no sense. And it's very clear that there will be a number of segments like that. So that's a policy reason. Uh, you want the connectivity with market participants. Of course, uh, the mission should be, at least in the first phase, uh, focused on wholesale, not retail, but still you need to understand the local law, the local language, etc. The second uh, reason, which is political more than policy, is that to state the obvious, and that was implicit in your question, there is fierce opposition for, to supervisory integration from NCAs and also from a number of market participants, as we have seen. Uh, but it's going to require a different political compromise from the ones that was achieved with the creation of European banking supervision, or for that matter, with European uh, Monetary Union. 
So you will need a political compromise at the high level where member states get something, but it won't be the kind of designs that we have with national central banks or in banking supervision with NCA. So it has to be something different. I would argue that given the nature of market supervision, it cannot be a compromise in which NCAs get something, but it can be a compromise where member states get something. So this is a political reasoning. I'm outside of my uh, area of expertise, but I think that works. So the, uh, basically what you want is to create buy-in from the member states, if not from the NCAs. Uh, so success, just the design would be that the ESMA officers uh, would both provide the local connectivity and could have specialization. So, for example, you could say, you know, accounting standards is in, I don't know, I'm, I'm putting random places in Amsterdam. Market infrastructure is in Frankfurt. You know, this or that thing is in Paris. Uh, Paris, anyway, is the seat of the organization. Uh, you know, something with fund management, absolutely in Ireland because they're so good at it. Uh, you know, that kind of things. Uh, again, it, it doesn't have to be this. But, but the idea is that you can uh, create that uh, basis for political consensus, which is difficult to uh, achieve in a framework which is generally more centralized uh, than what we have for European banking supervision because of the nature of what we're talking about. You mentioned Benoit Curé, his mention of competition authorities. Uh, I'm already past my time, so I won't expand on that. I will only mention that most, I believe, all competition authority, national competition authorities in the uh, European Union were created after the creation of the coal and steel uh, community and even after the Treaty of Rome. So they were created in an environment where they would be part of uh, European frameworks. That's obviously not the case for market uh, supervisors. Thank you. All right. So let, let's go to Verena. So Verena, echoing this idea that ESMA should become more decentralized, as you know, Nicholas just said. Some uh, some see the risk that Paris could become the EU leading financial center as a political obstacle to strengthen the, the role of HESMA, and argue that regulation and supervision should be separated, similarly to the setup in banking supervision. Uh, does strengthening HESMA really mean strengthening Paris as a financial center. And what do you think of the idea of separating regulation uh, at ESMA from uh, supervision in another entity? Thank you. Um, certainly, let me first, before I answer your two specific questions, take one step back because I just want to be clear. We're talking here in the panel today a lot about the supervision, centralization of supervision. But I fully agree that we don't, we are not going to build an effective capital market for Europe just by focusing on that. It's one of the aspects we need to look at, but it clearly can't be the only one. So just to make sure that we are not forgetting that. Um, on your questions, I think I would very strongly um, put that strengthening ESMA does not mean strengthening Paris. Strengthening ESMA means strengthening the European Union. It's ESMA is, happens to be based in Paris, but ESMA is an EU authority, and we have the interest of Europe in our heart. I might buy my croissant in the local boulangerie in Paris, but when I move into the ESMA offices, I'm a European. I'm not there to strengthen any particular center. I'm there to make sure that we actually have an effective European capital market. And I want to be clear, Please clear that that will drive every one of us in ESMA and has always driven. It's one of our core values is to be European. So no bias, no particular reference. What I think we also need to have, and I fully agree with Nicola, is the ability to really understand the markets in different parts of Europe, because they are different. Capital markets have developed very different in different parts of the European Union. So we need to have that understanding. Whether we need to be decentralized for that, I'm not quite sure. We're quite a small organization, actually, of 350 people. I'm not sure you want to split us around 27 different offices. I don't think that's necessarily the most efficient way to go about it, but that uh, we can discuss for a future uh, debate. Uh, so. Capital markets has to work for everyone. It has to be genuinely European. Um, then moving to um, the kind of collaboration with the NCAs, 
I think whatever we do and however we set up the central supervisory function, we need to work with the national competent authorities. In many cases, they have the expertise on the ground. We need to make sure that we use that expertise, that we can benefit from that. We don't want to just duplicate. We want to actually make it work effectively as a whole and make sure that we actually have the efficient use of all of our experience. And then part of that, I think, also goes to the governance point. Actually, if I think about how ESMA works at the moment, I actually have very heated and intense debates on certain things when it comes particularly to regulation and to guidance. When it comes to our direct supervision mandates, actually the trust of the whole board in the ESMA ability to do that and the ESMA staff is huge. So it's actually much less controversial, much less debated and people genuinely take their national hat off when it comes to the supervisory task. Um, finally, uh, on regulation versus supervision, I personally don't believe it is a good idea to start splitting that. Um, and again, I think you need to look at capital markets with its very different aspects differently from banking. In the capital markets, you clearly have very diverse specialization. You have people who supervise issuers, who look at prospectuses, you have people who are experts in fund management, you have people who uh, know about clearing and settlement, just to give a few examples. If you pull apart the few people and experts that you have into supervisors and policymakers, you really lose something because you need the virtual circle of understanding regulation to be a good supervisor and you need to be uh, having the supervisory uh, expertise to actually do good policymaking. Thanks. Thanks a lot. You have been very disciplined, so we have some time for for questions here from the audience from here and from remote. Before before uh, giving the the floor to the colleague that just raised his hand, please, I want to make just uh, you know what I learned today is that we are not just bank center in the cap in the in the intermediation, but you are too much. We have too much back in our mind, if I understand right, correctly. Right? We look everything through the model that we, you know, the way we intermediate savings is also shaping the way we think about in supervision. So we should move out of this mental scheme. Please, can you introduce yourself and... Uh, and uh, Giovanni Bassani from the ECB. Um, um, a more general question on the institutional framework. Um, I'm just asking because this morning the European Court of Justice issued a decision in which, I mean, I still have to read it uh, accurately, but in which basically said that the single resolution board is not an autonomous and independent uh, authority, but basically all the resolution decision needs to be, I mean, the real decision is coming from the European Commission. Of course, it was going back to the uh, old Meroni doctrine. Uh, so I was wondering, I mean, it seems, again, I have to read this judgment in, in more depth, uh, but it seems, again, that this all debate agency institutions, not that the agencies are once again um, put back to a sort of ancillary role. I mean, I'm maybe exaggerating. And uh, so I was thinking what Nicholas was saying, that there is already a model like AMLA. Apparently, I mean, if, if they need to supervise the markets, it takes a lot of discretionary decision, not like banking supervision, but I would say similar. It seems with the institutional structure and the institutional European framework, that's not possible. So either you are again in the, in, in the dilemma, you change the treaty, you create a real European institution to do that, or a European agency doesn't seem to be fit for purpose. Um, I haven't read the ruling either, so um, I remember ESMA short selling, uh, which was a ruling of, I guess, the same court. Um, so, uh, was what kind of SRB decision was the matter of the ruling? Was it uh, was that a resolution decision, or, for example, uh, a resolution in Banco Popular? That's interesting. Um, uh, okay. Um, well, to be uh, 
further explored. If you had ha asked the question yesterday, I would have said my impression of the jurisprudence of the uh, ECJ is that for the kind of things we're talking about in terms of supervision, uh, there is actually no doubt that Mironi gives the leeway. But again, uh, thanks for mentioning this new data point and we'll look at it. Thanks. So if uh, we actually did have a bit of a debate in this in the board task force, which looked at what we wanted to put forward as ESMA uh, on uh, the capital markets. And we one of the recommendations you will see is on the regulatory framework. And actually within that, one of the things we were very conscious of is that indeed sometimes the current legal regime is very restricted on the judgmental possibilities that you have and is quite uh, uh, st uh, going back to a world like Moroni, which really is not the world that we currently live in and where we have to make decisions, in which we have to make decisions. So I think it is something that is a real challenge in the agency setup. So I haven't read the, um, the judgment either, but I will read it with great interest because it's certainly, I think, one of the constraints that is there and that uh, at least some greater flexibility in interpreting the uh, various Moroni uh, uh, judge, uh, rules, I think, would be valid to have a look at. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I had a look at the, the question on, online, but it seems to me that, you know, <clears throat> the discussion has provided plenty of answer to the question that I am reading. So, in the, you know, to be on time, I just would close here. And, um, you know, my, my, my note says, this, conclu this concludes this session, and I'm sure we will continue to discuss these fascinating topics and complex topics for the years to come. I hope, I hope we will do something shorter than <laughs> years to come. So, but, um, you know, our, one, one fundamental uh, ingredient seems to be that regardless the, the the solution and the answer we found to this, the many questions that we have been raised today, the starting point is the really one, the same one that we need to find the political willingness to move to move ahead with this issue. So the momentum we have been seeing in the in the past months, we should keep it and make sure that we can carry forward this momentum in the next legislative cycle. Thank you all for intervening and um, thanks to the panelists and see, and uh, we will hear in a second from the ECB Vice President Luis de Guindos. We will provide the closing speech. Thank you very much.